Hi guys, this is Charles. I'm one of the surgeons at Southport. I'm here with Laura, our intern, and Jess, our anesthetist. And I have this patient that's about nine years old that has a hemangioma on its foot. And the hemangioma has been removed previously, but it recurred. And so we're going to do a wide local excision and, um, and possibly an axial pattern flap, the reverse soft saphenous conduit axial pattern flap to close the defect, just depending on how it looks when we're finished. Um, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications so that you'll get a ding on your phone the next time we live stream. Um, and for you, those of you that just joined us, this is a hemangioma, which is a benign growth on the side of the foot of this dog. It's been removed previously, but has recurred. And so we're going to do a wide local excision. And then we may do an axial pattern flap to close it. And we've also gotten permission to remove one of the toes if we need to. But I don't think that we're going to have to. Uh, I am going to have to be repositioning the foot frequently during the surgery for the axial pattern flap and stuff. And so if you can't see, just sing out. Let me know and I'll try to move the camera, try to keep up with what I'm doing. So... Um, anyway, so this is the planned surgical excision. And just start right here. I'm going to go right down to the bone. I don't care about removing the extensor tendons. That doesn't matter at all. Just going to go right down onto the bone. If you have any questions, we do have the live chat running. Can you hold on to that for me, please? Uh, and so I'd be happy to answer questions if I can. And we're excited to announce that our website, which is www.vetdojo, so V-E-T-D-O-J-O dot com is live, and that's our new e-learning platform. So www.vetdojo.com if you're interested in um, signing up on that. And there's some free content there and there's some paid content, but we are just going to try to add on to that often every week. Hopefully we'll have a new little module. Again, some of it's free, some of it's paid. And we'd really like your input as to what you'd like to see come up on that platform. All right, so I'm right down to tendons there, but I am going to take those tendons, and I've got a big vessel right here that is going to be ligated. Again, none of that is of any consequence. So um, the tumor is a hemangioma, which is a benign growth, but it does locally behave like a malignancy and that it'll recur unless you get clean margins on it. And so I'm going to do a big wide local excision and then decide whether I'm going to leave it open to heal by second intention or if I'm going to do a reverse saphenous conduit axial pattern flat. going right down to bone here. I'm going to take out all of the extensor tendons in this location. Extensor tendons really don't matter at all if you have to take them out. You will get no lameness or dysfunction with that at all. Just bring that over this way a little bit. Need to draw an X on the floor where we have to stay so it stays on the camera. Okay. 
Okay, if you're just joining us, have a look at our new e-learning platform, which is www.vetdojo.com, which is spelled V-E-T-D-O-J-O. -O. There's some free content and some paid content there. We plan on adding more and more of both as often as we can. Did you discuss with the owners the option of ECT? Uh, so electric chemotherapy, I'm not aware of it being used for hemangiomas. Um, and certainly our, I think our best chance for long-term local control would be uh, surgical excision. So good idea, thinking about ECT. Is it UV related? Uh, I'm not aware of it being UV related. Hemangiosarcoma, cutaneous hemangiosarcoma is UV related, but I'm not aware of hemangiomas being UV related. I'm just going around little by little, colorizing as I go. Is there going to be enough skin to close the wound after tumor removal? So um, there probably is not going to be enough wound, enough skin to close the wound. But we have a couple of op options here. The first one is just to leave it open by second intention. And I have no question that this will heal completely on its own. If left open to heal by second intention, it's just going to take a few weeks to months for that to happen. The alternative is to do a reverse saphenous conduit axial pattern flap. That's really the only axial pattern flap that'll reach down here. Okay, great question, and I'll, and I hate to say it. So, which the question is, which how do I know what structures I can take out with impunity, and which ones I have to leave in? And unfortunately, a lot of that comes from experience. Um, when I was at Colorado State University, we used to have a list of seventeen things you could not take out of a dog. When I left three and a half years later, it was a list of 13 things you could not take out of a dog. And so a lot of it is trial and error. A lot of trial, a lot of error. Um, but yeah, sadly, a lot of that comes down to just experience. All right, so let's see how we're doing on the back here. Still got a ways to go. Let's see if we can turn that over a little bit. That's great. Okay, so this, I haven't decided whether I'm going to leave it, leave it open to heal by second intention or not. Um, and I'm sure that it would heal by second intention. And so the bandage material that I would use would be just a non-adhesive dry bandage like melalin or something like that. Um, I'm not a gooper, so I don't believe in putting any kind of ointment or anything on the wound to... Uh, encourage healing. Um, I know a lot of people, somebody probably is going to mention honey, um, Manuka honey. So there was one study done by um, Bryden Stanley, 
that show that in sterile wounds like this is, that Manuka honey actually delays wound healing. Um, and so I would not be using Manuka honey on this. I think that there might be some advantage if you had an infected wound, but in a sterile wound, there doesn't appear to be any advantage. Let's just try to flip that up a little bit. We've got a bleeder somewhere underneath here. Um, so the only reason why you might not be accepted on that group is if you didn't answer the screening questions. And so if you just try to reapply and just say that you are a vet, um, you will be accepted. So some people leave that question blank. And um, generally what I, what I try to do is when somebody leaves the question blank is I go into their profile. And if it's obvious that they're a vet, then I'll go ahead and accept you. But if it's not clear that you're a vet from your profile, then I won't accept you. And so just put that you're a vet and then we'll let you in. So this is what we've removed here. Um, and when we look underneath, the margins are complete as far as we can tell grossly. Um, so that looks really, really good. I'm really happy with that. Now I've got a little bit of bleeding up top here. Just see where that's coming from. All right, and then I have to decide whether I'm going to do an axial pattern flap to close this. And the place that I would be taking it from is let me just move this over. Can you please release those two cables that are up there? Just Give me a little bit more room. That's great. And then just hang them back up if you could. All right. So the flap that we would do, it originates right here. And then it would come up on the medial aspect of the leg like this. based on the reverse saphenous conduit. Is that long enough? That should be long enough. And so I just have to decide whether it's worth the effort to do it or not. Um, and also whether we would have enough room to close the donor site, which we would. All right, so I'll go ahead and do that. So I'll start my incision here. Um, can you talk a little bit about axial? Yeah, so axial pattern flaps are based on a direct, like a particular vessel, um, as opposed to random flaps that are based on just the presence of adequate blood supply somewhere within the flap. Um, and so the the Axial pattern flaps that we have available. The only one that we have that would stretch far enough down the leg to be of any benefit is this reverse saphenous conduit flap. And it's interesting because it's the only flap that goes back toward the heart when you elevate it. Um, all the other ones go kind of away from the heart. Um, so you can see that this one's pointing in the opposite direction. And that's because there's a vessel in the skin that turns a corner and then heads back up proximally. Um, success rate with axial pattern flaps is about 85% in general. And then you just need to give them that time to declare themselves. Yeah, and so they'll, they'll declare themselves in about four days. Um, 
let's just see. First or second? Second. Um, that's all right. So, yeah, just keep an eye on that for me. Just so our anesthetist has pointed out a second degree AV block on this dog, which I'm not going to treat. Um, so if our TA staplers, if we were out of them and they were on order, um, I would delay the surgery until I had TA staplers. That just gives you an idea of how dependent I am on them. Um, and so are there other ways that you can do it? There are. You can dissect down through the liver parenchyma and then staple. But using TA staples just makes your life so much easier. And they're not outrageously expensive. I think they're about 100 US each. We get them from Infinity Medical. Um, used to get them from US Surgical. Um, but I would, I would strongly, strongly recommend that you use them if you're going to be doing any kind of lung lobectomies, liver lobectomies, anything like that. The amount of time that they save and the likelihood that you're going to have significant blood loss is really reduced by using axial pattern flaps. I mean, by using uh, TA staplers. What is it called? I might switch sides with you, please. Um, I have, I have never used vet biosis, but I'm aware of it. Um, and given that I have never used it, and I don't know that I've read about it. I don't know that I can comment on its success or anything like that. So I'm sorry that I useless in that regard. I believe there was one other question before swap sizes. Um, how do you know how long to extend the flap? So basically what we want to do with our flap is that we want to say, okay, this is the length that we need here. And so the origin, we're just going to flip the hand around, come over to here and make sure that we have um, adequate length. It's almost like using a protractor. All those things you think you won't need and have a lot. What's that? All those little things you have in school that you don't think you'll ever use. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just being really careful to preserve that vessel right there because that's the one that we need. It's right in there. I'll see if I can zoom in on that. Can you zoom in on the camera, please? Just right there. Yeah, go ahead. Is that zooming? You might have to get closer, get up right under, get, bring your hand down. It was um, trying. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so this is the vessel right here that we're trying to preserve. And this appears to be bleeding still, which is good. Now I'm just creating my bridge incision. Without disrupting my donor vessel. And if you guys can see all that blood supply in there. 
All right, so now we'll just flip that around like this. You should be so careful dissecting in that area because you'll just take out that blood vessel in a heartbeat. And I've done that so many times before. It's just, it just dies. Okay, it's just yeah, usually you try it and see how much of it you can get it to, you know, how much of it will survive. Yeah. But it's not good. Do you ever do tension relieving incisions? Uh, I don't like them because if you have dirty margins, then, um, then you're going to contaminate. Yeah. All right, so that's our... One right there, let's trade sides. Can I please have some 4 PDS? Okay, so we're going to have a question about are you trying to take a hyperdermal layout when doing the flat? What is your technique to preserve the blood supply? So you want to take not just the height, you want to take like the entire thickness of the skin. And you just have to be really, really delicate and be confident with your anatomy. All right, so put that around here like that. Oh, it should be okay. Is that is that still out of focus? Yeah. Is that better now? Um, yes. Okay. Can you zoom back out, please, for me? That's great, thanks. So I can extend it a little bit. Uh, no, that's all right. I'll just leave it like this for the moment. I don't like to bandage these afterward uh, because I don't want to create a tourniquet. Uh, so ligature can be used to seal liver, but it cannot seal biliary vessels more than about three millimeters in diameter. So you could not use a ligature to take off a whole liver lobe, for example. The blood vessels and the, the bile ducts are going to be too big.
the flat edges only? Uh, I'm yeah, you cannot suture the middle of the flap because you will uh, damage the feeder blood vessel. So only at the edges. Uh, there is a moderate risk for seroma formation, although I'm not too concerned about it. I will not put a drain in here. People spend a lot of time worrying about seromas um, and potential for seroma formation, and that's why they justify placing drains. But seromas just are not that big a deal. Possible to really bend that around like that. Thank you. Just doing a simple continuous suture pattern. Yeah. Sorry, I can't see. That's all right. Uh, next question How robust is this flap? And don't you know your secondary intention by? Uh, this flap is moderately robust. It's not as robust as a flank fold flap. Um, and look, we can always go back to second intention if this fails. But if it's successful, it'll give us a big head start on healing. Do you recommend resting and movement restrictions post-operatively? Yes, yeah, so a definite major exercise restriction for two weeks after surgery. Um, because what we want to do is allow this flap to adhere to the bed, and that can't happen if they're moving too much. And if I don't have enough skin here to close, even with the axial pattern flap, then I am going to have to bandage it. Um, so if we, uh, beyond, uh, normally I would not, um, I would do that for a skin graft, but for a flap, I don't want to create a tourniquet by placing a bandage on it. I don't know how to immobilize it without placing um, a bandage. So, um, but if I have any of this left open, then it's going to be left open to heal by second intention, then we will put a, a bandage on it. I don't think I'll put a splint on it though. So probably just like a modified Robert Jones, light padded bandage. This is kind of wound a candidate for a skin graft. If it is, would you do the graft after you've had granulation tissue formation? Yeah, so this is a candidate for a graft, but the graft is only going to take if you've got good granulation tissue underneath. People have used um, a pico drain, which is a negative wound therapy, negative pressure wound therapy drain, 
um, uh, to allow you to do a graft right at the time of surgery. I have not had a lot of success with that. There was one study that showed 100% success rate uh, with graft survival, but that certainly has not been my experience. Well, just one question for the name of the slot that you've So this is a reverse saphenous conduit axial pattern for Uh, so there really are no other options for a wound of this size. The only thing you can do is either leave it open to heal by second intention or do this flap. I guess you could potentially do a release incision on the other side. Um, I'm not really happy with that until I'm confident that I've gotten clean margins. Intermittently, yeah, you can go ahead and give some atropine. Yeah, 101. Just got a little bit of bradycardia here. An intermittent second degree AV block. So we will give it a bit of atropine. I definitely don't want to put this flap under any tension. Um, one question is, after the live trend is done, you can change the name of the video to include the name of the flap. Just make yeah. it easy for people to look it up later. Yeah. Um, post-op medication, any antibiotics? Uh, no antibiotics post-op. We're just giving intraoperative antibiotics. There's no indication for post-op antibiotics in these cases. Do you prefer keeping the suture line dry during healing or moist by using wet betadine bandage? Uh, I definitely prefer to keep it dry uh, and then just using a non-adherent bandage. I don't think there's any advantage to keeping it moist, in my opinion. Yeah, that's all going to have to stay open. I'll be able to pull that across a little bit there. So unfortunately, my flap isn't wide enough. You're always battling not creating such a big donor wound that um, you won't be able to close that with getting enough of a flap that you're going to be able to close the, the defect. Can I get some 4 PDS, please? Right, so that should close without any problem. Should be able to pull that across there. That's going to be a little bit of a struggle there. Move it that way, I think. Yeah. Uh, probably wouldn't bother with that. It's a good question. If the flap, if I wasn't able to get the flap to close, would I ever consider aborting the whole procedure and just returning the flap to the original site? Probably not, because if it fails, then we've got a donor site wound um, as well as a recipient site wound. And so I would rather just, if you know, if I was confident that the flap was not viable, I'd probably just sacrifice the the flap and then just do primary closure on the on the wound. No, that's still second. Yeah. Huh? I don't think that it's third degree. I think it's still second. Your blood pressure's okay? Yeah. 
I still think that there's a P associated with every QRS. Maybe try turning down your anesthetic a little bit. So um, the question that Laura has asked is what discussion do I have with the owners if I'm going to leave it open to heal by second intention? And the answer is that we just saw them it's going to be an open wound and it's going to require bandage changes every three to four days for the first couple of weeks after surgery. And then once we get granulation tissue, you can go to about every five or six days. Um, and that those bandage changes are going to have to take place either here or at the primary care vet. We generally do not allow owners, even with some healthcare background, to do their own bandage changes, um, just because a poorly placed bandage can result in necrosis of the extremity and potential amputation. So we would rather have them come back to us or go back to the primary care vet. Yes, you can, yeah. I definitely couldn't have made my flap any wider because this is, I'm struggling to get this closed even with what I took out. I'm not struggling, but it is under a bit of tension. Kind of regretting having done my axial pattern flap. Probably would have, in hindsight, probably would have just let it heal by second intention. Uh, so by delayed flaps, I assume you mean elevating the flap and then putting it back down on its donor bed and then coming back and then elevate and then putting it into position later. And the advantage of doing that is that you can make a little bit more robust blood supply in the flap. Um, I have done that on occasion, but not often. Good question there. sure where you mean at the cranial end of the incision. I'm just not sure where my Z plasty would come from. It's it's a good idea to think about tension relieving sutures or incisions, but I'm just not sure if it would be applicable here. Um, 
So if the sutures tear due to tension, it's just going to tear through the skin and the wound's going to fall apart. Uh, not catastrophic, but not ideal. All right, so I think that's all I'm going to close. And then I'm just going to do a forward interlocking in the skin. Can I get some 4 nylon, please? So that's all we were able to close, which isn't that much better than before. So, I mean, it's pretty fast though. It's double counting, yeah. Um, I'm just going to put in a couple of little sutures that's just going to close some of the soft tissue across the wound here and give me a little bit more of a head start. Just cover up some of that bone. flat. I'm going to be really happy about that. I'm going to cut out that suture and see where that's coming from because that is gushing. Hold on to that please. that around place for me. Release that finger there. And that, sadly, it's not coming from my flap. It's coming from the vessel underneath. So just flip that over for me like that. Coming from the bone, uh, underneath the bone there. here. Yep, look at that. That's good. So I don't know if you guys can see that. Bring that down here. That's bleeding pretty nicely. That's nice to see. Blood pressure also has really increased with our um, atropine, so everything's bleeding. Was there a question there? Um, Just a statement, that was actually cool. Yeah, that's Seeing cool. it bleed made me happy. Uh, Z plasty at the top of the wound, maybe. Um, yeah, that would be like if I was worried about the amount of tension that I was putting it under, that would not be an unreasonable thing to do. I'm just taking this connective tissue from the flap 
and covering over the bone. That's going to make it a lot easier for granulation tissue to form. So that's a great idea, negative pressure wound therapy. Um, that's our flat bleeding right there. That's awesome. Uh, may do that. Maybe just overnight. Have they shown a time frame in the study, like the minimum time frame required to see it? Uh, no, generally people keep it on for a couple of days. Can you let Tegan know that I'm nearly finished here? Okay. So my whole flap is bleeding, which is awesome. Um, and then I'm just going to do a little Ford and a walking suture pattern on my skin up top. And grab onto the vessel. And I'll have a bandage on it anyway, so. Oh, okay. I'd have been really annoyed with you, Laura, if I put my needle in and picked off a big vessel that started bleeding. And my flat turned black and you would have been unpopular. I definitely need new glasses. I need like super zoom glasses. I can spy movies. <laughs> Yes, please. Now as well, yeah, have you read them? Uh, adamant fan. <laughs> Never read a blog before, but I figure that might be what they're about. <laughs> Is that what blogs are like? Yeah, that's really useful. I quite enjoyed your one on clarity. Yeah. Not for the situation that occurred, but how you work through that process. The hamster wheel, like I described it. That was from my graduation speech to, it might have been the year before, yeah, I think it was with Chris Wood, Okay. his class. I've done so many of those that it's I can easily adapt those previous speeches and things to blogs. Oh, cool. That's great. Okay. I do enjoy a bit of a blog. Yeah. Um, I think it's Um, 
and I could almost envision uh, from your other one about your hand injury, the conversation that you and Kate would have had. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she was not happy with me. Quite long. Okay. Yep. All right, can I please get um, some melon and some stirrups? I'll just show you, I'll zoom out on this and I'll show you how I put on a bandage. And that'll just stay like that. And you don't want to, you want to be careful not to kink it over. Because you can, you can destroy the vessel. Okay. As in kink off the vessel. Yeah, I do. So I'm putting stirrups on to start with. Get our melon on to protect the wound. This is the product that we're using here. So it's just a, a non-adherent uh, permeable dressing. And just put that right on top. And we're just waiting for the rest of our bandage materials. Thank you. So this is cotton cast padding. And... Uh, I love Australia. I love living here. Pretty much everything, you know, everything about it. But the cast padding that we get in Australia is crap compared to what we can get in America. We used to get this really great 3M product. Um, and it was so much thicker and nicer than the stuff that we can get in Australia. I even thought about sending a truckload, <laughs> like a shipping container full, back to myself here. and Never got around to it. Yeah, but that would last me like a week here. Yeah. Um, so I used a Ford interlocking suture pattern. Um, it provides the benefits of a skin pattern in that the tension is not running along the entire length of the suture in that it's but let me just see if I can, I'm sure everybody knows how to do it, foot interlocking. Um, so you can see the suture pattern there. And because you double over on yourself every bite, it kind of maintains tension in the individual area rather than distributing it on the whole length of the incision. And it also um, provides better apposition than a, a continuous suture pattern. If it was intradermal, then we would have done just a simple continuous, but because it's, um, because it's skin, that's why we use the Ford interlocking. So now that we've done that, I fold my stirrups up. Uh, so no, I don't use anything. There'll be enough exudate coming out of the wound to keep it moist. I don't believe, like I'm, I'm not a gooper. I don't like, I don't do anything to keep the um, the wound moist. It'll stay moist by itself. Uh, have you tried Amazon for the soft band? Uh, have not looked recently. Um, if you have a link for it, I would be so grateful. And this is just going on very lightly because I don't want to create any kind of tourniquet effect. Uh, at this time, do you think the thickness grafting would be beneficial, though it may be all that second intention? So full thickness grafting, I, I, I sh don't think that you can use it until you've got a good granulation tissue bed down, particularly given the fact that there is exposed bone there and some tendon. I just don't think the graft would take. And so... Um, my preference would be to wait until we've got granulation tissue bed down and then consider using um, 
then consider using a graft. So I'll change this bandage every three days. Obviously from my bandage, I'm not using the negative wound therapy because um, I think that this will heal without any problem. Um, the other thing is that we're keeping the toes exposed um, so that you can tell if there's any swelling. So as long as those two toenails, let me just zoom in. As long as those two toenails can touch together easily, you know there's not swelling in the toes. But we instruct the owners that if the toes, toenails come apart like this, um, that, uh, that there's swelling there and we need to get them in straight away to get that bandage removed. And even like if you were in a practice that wasn't open 24 hours, I would live in, give instructions to the owner that if the toes swelled in the middle of the night and they couldn't get to an emergency center, just cut off the bandage and leave it open. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna come over and have a look and see. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can send any fan mail to Laura. Uh, and so that's pretty much it for me. If you guys have any questions, just post them in the messages after the video. And um, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications so that you'll get a ding on your phone the next time we live stream. And have a look at www.vetdojo.com, which is our new e-learning platform. So thanks again for watching. And I hope to live stream something again later on today. I'm doing an injection site sarcoma in a cat in the interscapular region. Um, and so I hope to be able to live stream that soon.